Father, in this moment, we choose to slow down and wait for you. Right now, you are all that we need. So quiet all the distractions stirring in our heads. Still the storms that have surrounded us and bring us in sync with your spirit. Even the young grow tired those who wait on you will renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And they shall lift up your name. Welcome to FCF Online. We are so excited that you're joining us this morning. It has never been easier to invite your friends to church. Click the like button, click the share button. Go ahead and invite your friends and family to join us this morning, right? Yes, we're excited that you have joined us this morning. If you have not heard the incredibly exciting news, in just a few weeks, we will be resuming in-person services. There will be live music, a fantastic message. You want to mark your calendars November 1st and look for communication from the church about registering to be a part. It's going to be a fantastic time and we are looking forward to worshiping with you. Amen. Acts 17 says that the God who made the world and everything in it, he is the Lord of the heavens and the earth and he does not dwell in temples made by human hands. That's right. Come on. He lives inside of every single one of us and the church is very much alive. Come on, sing this with us. You can put your hands together right there in your living wherever you're watching from.
doesn't matter what we feel like. We don't worship because we feel good. We worship because of who he is. And regardless of our circumstances, we choose to invite God into our circumstances and he will meet us right where we are. You know, Psalm 100 says to enter his gates with thanksgiving and to come into his courts with praise, to be thankful unto him and to bless his name. Thankfulness is the easiest way to enter into God's presence. So we just want to encourage you this morning to do that. Thank him for his goodness. Thank him for his faithfulness. Thank him for his mercy towards you. That's right. As we come into his presence. God, we're so thankful. So good, God. We're so thankful, God.
so grateful for the sacrifice that you made for us. God, that you would rather send your son to a cross to die for us than miss a chance to live inside of us. You didn't want heaven without us. And God, our only response to that is just to surrender ourselves to you, to give you all that we are every day of our life, every breath in our lungs. We surrender to you because you are worthy of it. God, you've been so good to us, so good to us. And Father, we want to hear from you this morning. God, we want to hear what you want to say to us through your word, which is alive and active. So now we lean in, God, to hear what you would say. Speak to our hearts in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And in one voice, we all said, amen. Amen. Come on, it's going to be a great service. Stick around. Amen, Pastor Pete. You know, I have to say that I truly just kind of feel overwhelmed this morning by God's faithfulness and His goodness, both to me and my own life and to our church. So, Pastor Pete and Jess, thank you so much for that beautiful reminder this morning. Thank you. I love you guys. Hey, so we've got a few things happening around here, just around the corner at FCF Church, in case you haven't heard. On October the 24th is our next women's event. It's a praise and prayer walk around our campus. On October the 31st is our next kids event. It's a costume and candy palooza. And then on November the 1st, uh, not only do you get an extra hour of sleep that night, but on that Sunday, we are launching in-person services. We can't wait to see you, church. Our services are going to be at 9 and 11 a.m., and we will also be live streaming those services as well. So look, to make all that happen, we're going to need to kind of build up our production teams. These are things like uh, camera operators, video switchers, technical directors, and pro presenter operators, uh, just to name a few of them. You don't need expertise, you don't even need experience. All you need is a heart to learn and a heart to serve. And we would love to have you join one of those teams. Hey, if you can play the drums, we'd also love to talk to you as well. So to connect with us um, and, and learn more about these teams, explore the opportunity, we just invite you to fill out our connect card today. There's a button below the video or a link that's gonna drop into the comment section, or you can just go to fcfchurch.com slash forms. And on that connect card right at the very top is just a little place that you check off that says, hey, I'm interested and would like to learn more. Pastor Pete would love to have you join one of his teams. Okay, today Randy's going to talk to us uh, as he continues in this series, Tug of War, Tug of Love. He's going to talk to us about devotion. And I want to share with you something that Jesus once said on this topic of devotion that's recorded in Luke's Gospel. And Jesus said this, he says, no one can serve two masters. He says, either you and I will hate the one and love the other, or we will be devoted to one and we will despise the other. Now, Jesus isn't just talking in general terms here. He's actually pointing to something very specific because in the very next line, he says this, we cannot serve both God and money. Let's let that sink in for a moment. You see, Jesus is telling us that that our relationship with money can actually cause us to despise our God. That's a pretty sobering thought, isn't it? But at the same time, we can also use our money to express our devotion to our God and His work in and through His church on this planet. So to express your devotion to our good and our faithful and our loving God, uh, we invite you to go to our website or the app or FCF Church dot com slash give. So let's learn more about this topic of devotion now as Randy concludes our message series today, Tug of War, Tug of Love. Good morning, FCF. Uh, Good to be with you this morning. And this, believe it or not, is the very last message in this six-week series that we've called Tug of War Slash Love. And the entire series, what we've emphasized is that God puts us into six basic contexts in life. And the, the main purpose for Him putting us in these contexts is that 
we can develop, we can grow, we can be stretched, we can be pulled so that we can actually learn to love the way that God loves. And it's critical that we learn the way uh, the love the way that God does because the universe can't function forever with everyone being safe and fulfilled unless every being there loves the way God himself loves. And even though uh, our relationships are a tremendous source of joy and happiness for our lives, that is not the primary goal that God has for them. This is important to know because if we think that happiness, you know, constant happiness is the goal of every relationship, then as soon as the relationship gets hard or difficult, we tend to bail. In fact, it, what we've said in this series is that the harder sometimes that relationships are, the more they fulfill God's purpose to pull us, to stretch us, to bring dormant capacities alive in us, to learn to love God's way. Remember, God's love includes forgiveness. It includes for parent, forbearance. It includes unconditional good devotion to those that deserve least, and so on and so on. So we close today with uh, a particular component of God's love or loving God's way that I'm calling reliable devotion. Um, the, the critical component is devotion that is reliable. Uh, reliability is something, if you think about it, that we really, really need as humans to function. And the universe really needs reliability. I mean, just, just you know, for a little childish thought for a while, I mean, just supposing that gravity was different every day that we woke up. We never knew from day to day if we were going to weigh 145 pounds or if we were going to weigh 10 pounds, all based on gravity. I mean, suppose that every time you ate something, it was different. Your taste buds were different. You know, what was once sweet yesterday, today is bitter and sour. It would be really difficult. Likewise, when it's hearing things. What if uh, one day all you can hear are very, very deep, bassy sounds, the next day all you can hear is high, piercing sounds? Same thing with our eyes, our vision. Suppose one day all you could see is everything really close up and another day all you could see is things far away or worse yet in black and white. What, what if um, pregnancies? What if some pregnancies went nine months and some went nine years? You mean we need predictability. We thrive on predictability or reliability. Now, now here, here's the tragic part. Even though we can see in these kind of silly examples how necessary reliability is, in the realm that we frankly need it the most as human beings, the realm of relationships, we find that that's the realm it is the hardest to be able to rely on. Reliable devotion is not something that's easy to find. Think about it. We have words in our vocabulary, and these words, just hearing them, can, can bring a dagger to our hearts. There are words like rejection. Any human being that experiences rejection on any level feels pain. It's real pain. How about these words? Abandonment. You're in a relationship, but you're just dumped. You're abandoned. You're deserted. Um, how about betrayal? You're in a relationship where you've trusted someone, you've, you've put yourself into a vulnerable place in that trust, and all of a sudden you're betrayed. These are real words. These are real occurrences. They happen to every day in our world. They've likely happened to each and every one of us that are, that are listening. What we're looking for is devotion, devotion that we can rely on. Let me read your verse from Proverbs chapter 19, verse 22. It says, What a person desires is unfailing love. That's reliable devotion. You're going to be devoted to me today. You're going to be devoted to me tomorrow, next year, next decade. You're going to be devoted to me when I'm at my best. You're going to be devoted to me when I'm at my worst and everything in between. That's the truth of what I want. That is the truth of what each of us wants. Being image-bearing beings made in the image of God, uh, made by Christ and for Christ, we are made for such a world as this, where every single being is reliably devoted to one another, that I can always count on, no matter who you are, no matter where we meet, you are going to be reliably devoted to me. You, you, you are for me. You are not against me. You are not going to judge me. You are not going to reject me. That's the world. That's the existence we want. Let me read it again. What a person desires is unfailing love. Today, I'm going to kind of bottle that into reliable devotion. What a person desires is devotion from another human being that they can rely on. It's never going to be taken away. We, we use devotion today sometimes as a tool to manipulate one another. We give it and we take it away. Sometimes we use it for to punish people. We give it and we take it away. 
These are not the way things were meant to be, and we all know this to be true. So let's start by trying to understand and understanding three different things about uh, reliable devotion. First of all, it's propriety. It's, it's just appropriate. It's just a necessary reality in a universe where you have free moral agents. By that I mean free will beings. We are made in the image of God, both us and angels, where we can think and feel and reason, and we have conscience and we have will and all these components. And of course, we even have physicality. Let me read you uh, from 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 in the New Testament. It says, this is real love, not that we loved God. I want you to let that sink in. God knows that we did not love Him first. This is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Notice, He didn't send His Son as a sacrifice to pay some penalty for our sins. He sent His Son to take away our sins, to accomplish something in us that would cause us to stop wanting to sin. But that's not the real point that I was trying to get in the verse. It's this. This is real love. This is real devotion. This is reliable devotion. Not that we were devoted to God. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us. So, reliable devotion it's eternal. It has eternally existed in God. It is who He is. When He makes beings that have the intrinsic ability to experience life on the level that He Himself does, He is utterly devoted to them, reliably devoted to them. He always wants their good, always seeks our good. He is always devoted to our good. So first of all, uh, de reliable devotion, it's just appropriate. If God is that devoted to us, it makes sense that we would be devoted that way to one another. The second thing about reliable devotion, it is extraordinarily powerful. Let me share a verse with you from Psalm 52, 8. It says, But I am like an olive tree. This is the psalmist you know, talking about his relationship with God. He says, I'm like an olive tree, thriving, thriving in the house of God. I will always trust in God's what? unfailing love. Why was he thriving? And what does he mean by thriving? He's growing. He, he's full of energy. He's full of enthusiasm. He's developing. He's becoming who God meant him to become, and he's doing what God meant him to do. He's thriving, and he says, I'm thriving in the house of God, meaning he's staying in communion with God, in fellowship with God. He's deriving his life from God, and he says that he knows that he'll always always have God's unfailing love. He trusts in it. He's relying on God's unfailing love or devotion for him, and it's powerful. It's causing him to thrive. This is, this is a really key thing. You and I that were made by Christ and for Christ, every human being that you'll ever meet, every human being that I'll ever meet, we were meant to thrive or develop or grow in a context of reliable devotion. Everybody that we meet, all of our family members, all of our friends, all of our work associates, even the strangers in the community, uh, even the, the enemy, we, we can rely that they're against us, but we can rely on it. And then our fellow Christians, we were meant to thrive. You and I only can, really get this, get this one folks, you and I can only truly grow, authentically grow, when we are in a context of reliable devotion, when we know that the people in our context are reliably devoted to us. This is when we thrive. We can look at this in uh, you know, every ordinary, ordinary situations. We know that in families where there is not reliable devotion, people get hurt, they get wounded, they get confused, they get disoriented, and we have dysfunction. Dysfunction in our lives, dysfunction in families. We need to grow healthy and authentic, reliable love. When, when I'm in a situation, when you're in a situation where I'm not sure that I'm being looked at as being significant and I'm not secure, I'm not going to be able to grow authentically. Why? Because I'm going to be driven by fear and I'm going to seize everything I can to just survive. That's going to be first and foremost self-preservation. The second thing I'm going to look for is anything that will bring me some pleasure and joy because I just don't know what I'm going to get out of life. So I become so fear-driven that all my decisions are made in darkness. They're based on either self-preservation or self-gratification because I'm not immersed in unfailing love. Now, we all know, ever since the, the fall of mankind, the, broke, or the break of trust with God, we're, we're not ever in perfect environments of unfailing love or reliable devotion. But nevertheless, 
the more that we experience of that, that brings authentic growth. We feel relaxed. We feel we know we're significant to some level. We know we're secure. And then we can be authentic. We can look at life. We can reason. We can choose our value system. We're, we're not so fear-driven. So authentic growth and spiritual growth, I might add, you won't grow as, as a Christ follower. We won't grow to be more and more like Christ unless we know that we're safe and secure in Christ. If we still are struggling with the fear that God himself is going to reject us or he's going to get angry at us or he's going to punish us or he's going to cast us off, we will never grow. You can't grow when, when you or I are fear-driven, knowingly or unknowingly. So this reliable devotion is very powerful. It helps us to thrive. It helps us to grow. The third thing about it is it's permanent. It started, it originated in eternity past with God for a short period of time when God has allowed the rebellion, both of humans and angels. It's kind of broken down, but it's always there. It always exists in God, and God has promised, He's made it very clear in His Word, that eternity to come will forever be full of reliable devotion. For a very short period of time, God is allowing evil so that He can abolish it forever. But in eternity to come, everybody you meet, every t corner you turn, you're going to meet a human being that is reliably devoted to you. You won't ever have to think about it again. They're not going to judge you. They're not going to critique you. They're not going to think anything ill of you. They're not going to be suspicious of you. They're not going to be fearful of you. They're not going to leave you out. You're going to know that you're loved. You're going to know that you're wanted. You're going to know that you're respected. And that's the environment that you and I were created for. And that's the environment that we thrive in. This is permanent. This is the certain future. This world that we live in now where it's a struggle. It's a struggle to find reliable devotion. It's a short-lived time. It's got a short shelf like the world is coming, the eternal world is coming. It's one where reliable devotion will just immerse everyone all the time. That's the promise of God. Now, as wonderful as it is to understand something about reliable devotion, it's tremendous, you know, propriety and its power and all like that. What's even better is for you and I to get to a place where instead of just being recipients of reliable devotion from God, we, we are those that give reliable devotion to others. So I want to turn the corner a bit, but before we do, I want to give you a little example, and I hope as simple as this example is, it will, it will lay a foundation that will allow us to go forward in this, because the, there's a real problem when it comes to me giving reliable devotion to other human beings that are imperfect, and I'm imperfect too. They are needy. I am needy. We, we run into some trouble. So, so let me give you my little story, and hopefully this will lay a foundation and help. Imagine this, and it's a purely imaginary situation. You want somebody to make a grand, wonderful dinner for you and, let's say, 10 other people. It might be your family. It might be your friends, but, but you want to pull out all the stops. You want it to be a grand, grand dinner. And you're going to pick one of two individuals to make this grand, all the stops pulled out dinner. The first person is one of the greatest chefs in the country. He or she is well rested. They're well prepared. They've got everything they need. They're eager to jump in and help out. That's candidate number one. Candidate number two, they are a person that literally are on the edge of death because they have not eaten for nearly 40 days. They haven't had water uh, in three days and they literally are, are dying of hunger and thirst. They also are an expert chef, expert cook, but they're, they're dying of starvation. Now you say, Randy, this is a silly, silly illustration. Uh, when I ask, well, which are you going to choose? Well, obviously, you're going to choose the healthy chef. You're going to choose the strong chef. You're going to choose the rested chef. You're going to choose the chef that's full and therefore has plenty of energy and capacity to give. The starving chef who is on, on the edge of demise, you know they can't give anything. They are, in dire, they are in such dire need of receiving that until they receive for a while, they'll never be able to give anything. You say, okay, I got that, Randy. Where, where are you going with this? Here's what it comes down. It's this. Unless, unless you and I will be 
sufficiently receptive to God's reliable devotion. Unless, unless we will drink in, unless we will take in, unless we will uh, access again and again and again God's reliable devotion to us, it is highly unlikely we're going to have the capacity, the ability to give reliable devotion to others who in many cases, if not most, are not going to deserve it and maybe won't even appreciate it. Here's one other thing to tuck away. That image that I gave you of the one chef that is dying of starvation and dying of thirst and the other chef that is, you know, fed well and rested well, I want you to keep this image in your mind and here's why. Every human being you will ever meet in life, every human being that I'll ever meet in life, they fall in between that spectrum. And you and I need to recognize this. There are some people that are so starved. They have been so starved out for devotion. They don't have anything much to give. Lots of people fall in between. They're maybe not completely starved out, so they have something to give, but it's going to be imperfect at best. Please, please, let's stop expecting levels of perfection from humans that they can never give us. We're all broken. We're all needy. We're all somewhere in that spectrum between being well-fed and, and rested and, and starved out, probably somewhere in the middle. I want to read a statement that I hope summarizes this for you. Finite created beings require an infinite uncreated source of reliable devotion. You and I will drain another human dry. We'll take everything they have and it still will not be enough. We never get enough devotion. So let me read it again. Finite created beings, that's me, that's you, require an infinite uncreated source, that's Christ, of reliable devotion. We can never drain Him dry. So we must first access His reliable devotion. We must take it in. It's got to reach our souls. It has to kind of fill our tank to the place where we have an inner fullness or else we will expect and seek and even demand from human beings a level of reliable devotion that even though they may want to give it to us, they just don't have it. They, they, they may give what they have, but what they have will not be enough. So, next statement. Don't demand from people what only Christ can give. Maybe that's the whole message to some of you. Maybe you, you've been so frustrated with some of your relationships because you're looking for reliable devotion and you're looking for recognizable affection and multiple other things we talked about in this series. But you must understand that it comes down to this. Don't demand from people what only Christ can give. People can give you what they have, but it's always going to be a little bit imperfect. It's always going to be a little bit broken. Get your tank. I must get my tank filled from the living water of Christ's constant love. He, he can give me the endless supply of reliable devotion that I need. He has a capacity to know everything about me, love me through everything, bear with me through everything, understand the exact word I need to be able to comfort me and strengthen me in ways that no human being can. If I'm full enough from the reliable devotion of Christ, then whatever imperfect fragment of reliable devotion I get from another human being, it's wonderful. It's, it's icing on the cake because I'm already sufficiently full and I just can rejoice in whatever imperfect version I get from another person. More importantly, I will not get frustrated and I will not become embittered at the people. If, if I'm trying to get from humans what only Christ can give, I'm going to be frustrated and I'm going to get embittered in them. Some of you need to stop right there. Because the truth is, there, there may be some people in your life, you are frustrated with them and you're bitter at them. But the truth is, you're expecting, wanting, needing from them something that, that they maybe just can't give. They may be trying with all their hearts, but, but they're imperfect. They're, they're half starved themselves. They're, they're trying perhaps, but you can't give what you don't have. Get what we need from our infinite Creator, then what we receive from finite fellow human beings will be just icing on the cake. So, before I can give reliable devotion to others, before I can give it, I must first receive it from my infinite Creator, and then I won't be demanding from people what only Christ can give. All right, once, once I'm there, 
there's three important concepts about giving reliable devotion for others. The first is this, intentionality. In other words, I won't, I won't give reliable devotion to others in my circle of influence, in the six, the six context. Uh, I won't be giving it to the people in my family. I won't give it to my coworkers. I won't give it to my friends. I won't, I won't give it to the, uh, the people that I just, the strangers I meet in the community or even to my enemy. Remember Jesus said, Luke 6, 27, you can do good to your enemy, you can pray for them and bless them even though they're cursing you. And then our fellow Christians. I, I won't do that unless I'm in, intentional about it. Intentionality is key to giving to others within our six context reliable devotion. Let me read you a simple verse from the book of Romans chapter 12 verse 10. It simply says, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Now here's one of the things about intentionality, that, that I'm going to give reliable devotion because God says that's who He is, that's what He does, but until it becomes a personal conviction in me. In other words, if I'm just doing this kind of mindlessly, well, God says it, and I don't want Him to be disappointed with me, or I don't want Him to be mad at me, and I want Him to bless me, um, so I, I'm going to do what He says because, you know, I don't want to get on God's wrong side. You're never going to be able to do this with much persistence. You and I need to be intentional about giving reliable love, but we have to have some convictions about it. What do you mean, Randy, convictions? I mean this that we've thought this thing through sufficiently and we believe that people deserve this. That, that I feel about this like God does. God believes every being in the universe that is an image bearer des deserves His reliable devotion and He gives it freely and He gives it to those that don't deserve it at all. It, we might call it unconditional love. So until I come to a conviction that, you know what? whether people appreciate it or don't appreciate it, whether people reciprocate and give it back to me or don't reciprocate and give it back to me, it's just simply right. The universe needs this. The future is going to be full of it. So I'm going to embrace this and become intentional about giving reliable devotion to everyone in my six circles or my six contexts. Doesn't matter what they do, doesn't matter what they do with my reliable devotion, doesn't matter if they deserve it or they appreciate it, doesn't matter if they reciprocate it. I've come to a, a personal conviction, this is, this is beautiful, this is right. I love the notion. I'm glad God is like this. When we come there, when we have real authentic convictions, then our intentionality will start to move us into a lifestyle. And that brings us to this, the second point. Now this is really important in our day and age. So we need intentionality. The second thing we need is adaptability. So when I'm going to give reliable devotion to people, I need to be like God. God is very adaptable, very flexible. Let, let me read you a couple of verses. You'll know where I'm going. In the New Testament book of Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, it says, let the message of Christ dwell among you. And that word dwell, it means be at home in you, dwell among you richly as you, now listen to these two words, as you teach and admonish. The second word is admonish. As you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. That word admonish is it's kind of an unusual word. You don't hear it much today in our society, and we've kind of lost track of what it means. Well, well the actual Greek word that's used there, nutheteo, it had a very specific meaning. To admonish, nutheteo, it meant that I'm going to come to someone and I'm going to confront them with truth, God's truth, God's view of how something should be handled, and I'm going to confront them hum humbly, lovingly, but I'm going to confront them for the purpose of correcting them. This is important. Adaptability, reliable devotion should always be given but reliable devotion should be adaptable. I'm going to read you one more, and then I'm going to, I'm going to bring this in, into better focus. Listen to this from Proverbs 27, uh, verse 6. It says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. What I'm trying to say is this. We have this notion in our society today, and this has become popularized, and, and it's almost becoming systemized to the point that uh, you know, any other view is, is looked upon as being a, a hater or a hateful person. We have this view that if you're my friend, if you're for me, if you're, gonna, if you're devoted to me, let's put it like that, if you're reliably devoted to me, you are going to support anything that I want to do, anything that I want to pursue, anything that I believe, anything that I say. In other words, 
If you're really reliably devoted to me, you're going to give me unconditional support. And that is a lie. That, that, that is straight from the pit of hell. That is destroying multiple lives. And we live in a world today where nutheteo, admonition, confronting someone, the wounds of a friend that are faithful, the notion that we care, we are so devoted to someone that we're going to tell them what God says they need to hear rather than what they want to hear. Let me repeat that. You see, reliable devotion, God's way, it means that I'm going to tell someone what God knows they need to hear rather than what they want to hear. It's really tough. It's a hard thing when you know that you're having to say something to someone that, that they are not going to like, they're not going to agree with it, they may reject you, they may hate you, they may categorize you, they may call you a racist. God only knows what people do today. You can't say much today to people that contradicts their ideas or thoughts about something, even if it comes straight from God's Word, without being categorized. But nevertheless, God's kind of reliable devotion it's adaptable. It's flexible. I'm not going to support something that I know is ultimately going to be destructive, that God says is going to be destructive for someone. That's not reliable devotion. That's kind of a hellish deception. Let me read it again. Proverbs 27, 6, it says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. A friend will tell you what God says you need to hear rather than what you want to hear. Likewise with me. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. The people that will tell you whatever you want to hear, that will support whatever foolish thing you and I may want to do, these are not our friends. That is not reliable devotion God's way. That's the kind of false devotion that our society is promoting today and that we need to be very careful about. There's one last aspect or one last uh, final component of giving this reliable devotion, the way that God gives it, and I'm going to call that continuity. And continuity, it's the idea that, that this is foreign to me, okay? To devote my life to giving to everyone in my six, you know, context, to be continuously, reliably devoted to them, I need to learn this. I, I wasn't born with this intrinsically in me. You weren't born with it intrinsically in you. It's not instinctive. We need to be taught. We that are made in the image of God, we need to be taught virtually everything. And God's choice is a slow learning process, by the way. Nevertheless, we need to learn. But there's a key to this. When I say continuity, I have to be, uh, I have to be one that, that practices with an improvement orientation. In other words, I'm going to start to try to do this. I'm going to remind myself of it. But I'm always going to be looking to see if I'm doing it a little bit better, a little bit more regularly. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm taking it into other realms that I've never taken it before. So it's going to be herky-jerky at first. It's, it's not going to be new to me. It's not going to come natural. It's going to be bumpy. It's going to be imperfect. But I'm going to keep practicing it with an eye toward improvement. This is a very important concept. Let, let me just give you something to think about. You know, athletes and people in various fields, musicians, so forth, they practice. But there's two ways of practicing. There's some people that practice kind of mindlessly. They're just kind of doing what they've learned over and over again. It's not that that's terrible or, terrible or anything, but it's not the highest level of practice. Improvement-oriented practice is the really powerful concept. In other words, I'm practicing, but I'm always seeking to improve. And once I improve and hit one level, I'm going to now try to practice so that I can improve and hit another level. And I'm going to keep this. There's going to be a continuity where I am practicing with an eye toward improvement. When you and I say, Lord, I'm going to learn to be reliably devoted to every human being within my six context. And I'm going to do this in a way with an eye toward improvement. I'm going to practice it. It's going to start off. Listen, folks, one of the things that I've, I've been teaching for years at FCF is anything that you and I are ever going to do well, we have to be willing to do poorly first. Anytime we take on a new practice, we don't do it well. It takes time. It takes persistence. It takes uh, improvement-oriented focus. And so... Unless I'm going to be willing to devote some time and devote some effort and try to keep improving, I'm not going to be able to incorporate this as a, as a kind of a, a reflexive lifestyle response. Let me read you a verse that kind of uh, emphasizes this a bit. It says, Let no debt 
remain outstanding. This is Romans 13, 8. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another, for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Our, our debt to love one another, it's in this sense, it's, it's just the universally appropriate thing to do. We're made in the image of God. Every image bearer deserves for you and for me to be reliably devoted to them. Let, let me give you a couple, couple things to think about. It, it might look like this. What, what if we just started these three kind of ideas going through our head? God, help me to respect and to show respect to every human being that I meet for the rest of my life. God, I want to always have goodwill for every human being I ever meet from now on. In fact, I am. I'm going to have goodwill. I'm going to respect every human being I ever meet from now on. I'm going to have goodwill. I want nothing but your highest good for every human being I meet. Thirdly, God, I'm going to go as a servant. Every human being that I meet from now on, I'm going to, I'm going to see what, what can I do to help? What can I do to bless you? How can I build you? How can I, how can I do something to move you closer to God's plan for your life, if that's at all possible? If we were to just take those three things, put them in the context of improvement-oriented practice, continuity, it, it becomes very dynamic, and over time, over, over years and decades, it, it can truly, truly be a transforming thing for us, as well as a transforming experience for those that we interact with. So, reliable devotion is rooted in God. It's the destiny of eternity. And it's something that God wants us to start incorporating, to start giving to others, because we learn by doing. As we give it, it also starts to change us inside as we're doing it. I want to close with um, uh, an illustration that I hope kind of ties all these loose ends a bit together. Once again, imagine a situation, and this happens quite frequently, a situation where you're walking through the park somewhere and you literally see uh, a baby just left in maybe its little holder, its little uh, carrier, and you look around, you don't see another adult there, the baby is crying, and so you, maybe you and your wife, you know, you, you pick the baby up and you take it home because you can see that it needs to be changed and it needs to be fed, it's not in great condition, you don't know how long it's been out in the weather, so you take it home and you immediately meet its urgent needs. You call the authorities, you uh, let them know what's happened, and you bring all the help, the appropriate help in from the uh, legal community that you need, and you immediately decide you want to do what you can for this child. You and your wife, or, or you and your husband, whatever the case may be, you, you decide you want to adopt this child. You start taking legal action to adopt this child. You have started a process of giving your devotion, reliable devotion to this child, and you are wanting to give reliable devotion to this child for the rest of its days. Now, let's ask some questions that might appear silly, but I'm going somewhere with this. Why? Uh, why, why are you giving this child initially your reliable devotion, and why are you pledging? To this child your reliable devotion. Why do parents ever adopt children is a way we might ask it. I mean, is it because that uh, when, they, when they meet the little baby, the little baby is so talented, they just have to have that baby in their life? Is it because the baby is, is so extraordinarily attractive? I mean, babies are cute, but come on, they're, they're not that attractive. They haven't developed. Uh, is it because the baby is, has such an IQ, such an intellectual giant? No, that's not it. Uh, is it because the baby is so kind and so warm and so thoughtful and just says the right thing to you all the time? No, the baby can't even talk. Uh, I know what it is. Maybe it's because that baby just can't do enough for you. It just wants to help you and serve you and just always be a support to you. No, no. You, you know how ridiculous all those things are. Baby can't do anything for you. Why would you be reliably devoted to this helpless, inappreciative life form, okay? That wasn't even your responsibility. Why? Well, of course, the answer is obvious. You know why. We all know why. You know that that child that is helpless is still of intrinsic worth and value. You know, you may not connect it that it's made by Christ and for Christ, made in God's image, but you do know this. 
You know that child, that, that tiny little child that can't even say a word, that can't even feed themselves, that tiny little child has within themselves the capacity to experience life at the level that you yourself experience. That, that child will one day have the capacity to love and to feel joy and to feel celebration and all the wonderful things that life has to offer. You know that capacity is there. God knows that we, as His human creations, we have the capacity to experience life on the level that He Himself experiences this. He gave us this. I'm not saying we're ever going to be God. I am saying He gave us the capacity to experience life like He Himself does. This makes us, we are born with intrinsic, God-given worth. We do not need another human being to validate us. And when we look for other human beings to validate us or give us a sense of worth, we inevitably become disappointed, frustrated, and embittered. Okay? So we have to look at this thing that every human being deserves, deserves our reliable devotion, not because of anything they do for us or will ever do for us. We got to go into it like that. But because they are created by Christ, they are created for Christ, and they have the potential to experience life on the level that God Himself does, and they have the potential to become like Christ and to become beings that just bring tremendous good, tremendous joy into the universe. Now, I want to add one more piece to this. Let's take that scenario, and I hope I'm not offending anyone that may be adopted in the audience, but, but please bear with me on this. Let's take this adoption scenario. Let's say this child now grows up. There's, there's two narratives that this child in this imperfect world of ours, and with these imperfect souls of ours, there's two narratives this child will likely struggle with. The child might struggle with thinking, my real parents abandoned me. My real parents deserted me. My real parents didn't want me. My real parents must have seen me as worthless. My real parents saw me as, as an inconvenience. And if we embrace, knowingly or unknowingly, that narrative, we will suffer greatly. We will always struggle with feeling that we have any intrinsic value or worth. We will always be insecure. We will never find satisfaction in this life or, or you know, whatever somebody does for us. The second narrative, though, and, and I think that we, we probably struggle in between. Maybe even those that are truly adopted go back and forth on this. The second narrative is beautiful. I am of such worth that these people that didn't even bring me into this world, these strangers could not stop but to become reliably devoted to me for life. They saw me as that valuable. They were committed to me feeling secure. I could live my life with that narrative, and it's going to do positive things in me. I'm going to grow. I'm going to develop. And I will then be one that is likely to give reliable devotion to others. If I live with the first narrative, that I'm a reject, that I'm worthless, that I've been abandoned, that I've been an inconvenience, I will not likely ever be able to give sufficient reliable devotion to others. Now, I want to say what I said before. I think probably people that are truly adopted probably go back and forth in these narratives. That's where Christ comes in. It's when we receive our value from Him, when we know that He is eternally, reliably devoted to us, that should swing the narrative in a way that keeps us on the healthy side of that equation and that empowers us then to be those that can give to other human beings, this is where I really want to go with this, other human beings that don't deserve our reliable devotion, that don't appreciate our reliable devotion, but we won't be frustrated and we won't expect reciprocation and we won't even expect appreciation and we won't become embittered. We will still be able to offer it to give it because we're being filled with Christ's reliable devotion and we'll be those that can then mirror it and pass it on to others and bring great healing, help, and a developmental environment into the life of other people. I hope that's the choice. <clears throat> I hope that's the choice we'll each make. I want to share one last phrase with you. <clears throat> Embrace Christ's reliable devotion to you, then determine to give it to others. Let me read it one more time. I hope that each of us who hear this message embrace Christ's reliable devotion to you, then determine to give it to others. Now, some of you, 
you've maybe never taken that first step to put your trust in Christ, your Creator, and become His follower. He suffered and died on the cross to demonstrate to you the depths of His love and His trustworthiness. He is the almighty Creator of the universe, but He loves you and I so much with full knowledge of our imperfection, our sinfulness, our rebelliousness. He comes offering us forgiveness and full acceptance in eternal life if we're just willing to put our trust in Him and become His followers. So let me read it one last time. Embrace Christ's reliable devotion to you. Put your trust in Him. Become His follower if you've never done that. And then determine you're going to give it to others for the rest of your life because God wants it. Others deserve it and it will bless your soul as a giver of it. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you that in a world that can be cold and harsh and frightening and wounding, that into this world you communicate the depths and riches of your reliable devotion, your unfailing love to us, and how desperately we need your unfailing love, your reliable devotion. Help us to take it in and then help us to give it out for the rest of our days. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Wow, what a powerful word this morning, FCF Church. It's so important that we choose to embrace God's reliable devotion, but it doesn't stop there. We must then choose, resolve, decide to take that reliable devotion, that unfailing love that God has shown us and give it to everyone that he has put in relationship around us. And by choosing to love that way, we're in fact loving God's way. We want to thank you for worshiping with us this morning. And if this is your first time, we would love to know about it. You can click on the connection card link just below this video or the link that drops in the comments section. If you need prayer, we would love to pray with you. You can also click on the Zoom prayer link just below this video or the Zoom prayer link that'll drop in the comments section. Look, it's been a great service. You're going to have a great week and we will see you right back here next Sunday. We love you, FCF. God bless you.